right then. Well, once again, it's a blessing to, uh, to be with you all on this, our Lord's Day. It is a, it's a wonderful day that the Lord has made for us, and as the Word reminds us, we, we do rejoice, and we are made glad in it. Uh, we are so thankful that God has allowed us the, uh, the privilege of being able to communicate in this manner. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the issue of whether or not we hear the Word of God. There is no doubt. Uh, whatsoever that we miss the uh, connectivity we miss not being with each other uh, I was talking to someone yesterday uh, remember we're 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 known as the body of Christ and the body is together the body is all you know joined together as it would remind us in Ephesians chapter 5 is about what every joint supplies and so uh, it's not a virtual body it's a it's a real body it's just that uh, God is allowing us this time of testing. He's permitting this time of testing. And so it's up to us to make sure that we uh, still trust the Holy Spirit to help us remain engaged, uh, utilizing the tools that God has given us. Uh, you know, I thought about this uh, the other day. I said uh, in 1918 uh, when the pandemic took place uh, and people were not able to, you know, gather together and, and the like, uh, the, that the, 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 the thing that made things different then is that uh, people were locally connected to one another. In other words, the, uh, the, the churches were part of the community and people didn't have to travel far and all of that sort of thing. Our time is different. Uh, we migrate. We come from, you know, some members come as far as uh, 40 miles away to get to the building and the like. And so it makes it a little bit different for us in terms of connectivity. And I just thought about that just from a historical standpoint. Uh, churches uh, back in the day, it was more local because people didn't have cars and things of that nature uh, like we have today. There was no su such thing as um, 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 mass transit as we know it. So that, that makes it different. So we've got to find other ways that God has given us other means to stay connected. And this is one of the ways that we do it with Facebook Live, uh, with uh, what we do with um, uh, YouTube, uh, what we do with Zoom, what we do our conference calls. All of those things allow us to stay connected. Uh, and what we don't want to do is be unthankful. We we'll need to be grateful and thankful to God for this opportunity that God gives us to still be able uh, to communicate uh, with each other. So this morning... Uh, we're going to uh, go to our time of prayer. There's a lot of, a lot of our family members and people we know, uh, directly, indirectly, who are going through seasons of death and of disease and sickness right now. And so we want to pray for those families. Thank you, Zach. We want to pray for uh, the Pray the Family. That's uh, Sister Cynthia Berry and her sister Tamara. Her, their mother passed away. And her funeral service is going to be this coming Friday. And so we ask that you would pray for them. And then we've been praying for Kristen Henry family. That's um, uh, Sharon, uh, Sister Chandler's daughter. Her uh, daughter, again, uh, Sister Gretz Chandler's granddaughter, 36 years old, who died. And so we're praying for them. Uh, we've got news that Jeffrey Edward, who is the uncle of Rose Johnson, uh, who passed away. The uh, former pastor and a friend of a good friend of mine, a good friend of ours, Pastor Arthur Young, of um, uh, he uh, passed away, and so we want to lift up that family. Brussel was part of that church family for many many years, and um, we know him by way of Pastor Uri Just Uri Justice, Uri, um, Pastor G, not Pastor G himself, but his wife. She passed away, and so a lot of connectivity that's there. And so we just want to. Uh, Pray for those families. Found out that Cal Calvin Burleson, who is a, um, a, a Mary and Lois's brother, is very ill right now. I want to pray for him and also praying for Michaela Henry, who is uh, their uh, niece. That's Kimberly's daughter, who is uh, recovering from major foot surgery that she had. And uh, we certainly want to be uh, lifting them up in prayer. There are so many others. Our regular prayer concerns is Sister Addison and Milton and Cliff, Carolyn, Clyde. Ella, Brother Callahan, Nell, Essie Chandler, Gordon, Herman, Sister Paulie Dunham, Sister Almira, Larry Henry, Carol Jackson. Uh, we're still praying for Reverend Linton Jason and his recovery. 
praying for Luana and James Leonard, Otto Smith, Philomena Thomas, Lee Williams, Mary White, and Viesta Zachary, and so many others. We know about Hope and her family. We continue praying for them. Father God, we uh, love you again and thank you so much just for the privilege of being able to communicate with you, to talk with you, and to talk to you matter factly, to talk to you sincerely, to talk to you with integrity, to talk to you with transparency. And we recognize we might as well tell the truth when we talk to you because you know everything about us. Uh, you know some things about us we haven't even, we don't even know. So we, uh, we thank you, God, for just being able to have that, that opportunity to be transparent with you. And, and one of the things we got to be transparent with, and I know I got to start with myself, Lord, to admit that I have sinned and fall short of your glory. I have done some things that have been contrary to your word, to your will, and to your way. I've said some things. I've failed to uh, take captive my thoughts so many times. So rush, I rush that you would forgive me of my sins. Not only for me, Lord, but for those who are listening today, those who agree with me, that you said if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us, and that you cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For that, God, we are thankful. We're humbled by that reality, and we are grateful that you choose to forgive us, uh, even though we, we know better, even though we choose to do things that are contrary to your word, you give us another chance, and for that, we say thank you. And now, Lord, uh, we certainly want to lift before you those names that have already been mentioned, those families that are going through seasons of death, the Pray the family, the Henry family, the G family, the Edward family, the Young family. God, you know every situation, you know every detail much better than I could ever know. So I ask for comfort, Lord, as only you can give. You know, you know what each person is going through and you know how they're going to go through it, but Lord, help them to know that you are very present help in that time of trouble. So I want to live before you, Calvin Burleson. Calvin is dealing with some issues of, a heart, of his heart. Um, and so we just lift him before you, God, and or his wife who comes alongside him. I just pray for your strength for them, uh, that you would uh, allow them to know that you are God, and they would sense your presence they would sense your power. Pray for Michaela uh, in Dallas, God, in her recovery. And I just ask again, you continue to bless her in the knee she stands, allow her, her foot to uh, heal and let it be well and, and let it recover well. I pray for her mom and her dad, her brother, uh, that concerns for her. And then again, for all of those other persons, God, some we know. Oh, that we hear about on the news, the COVID-19 situation that appears to be getting worse, in particular in our state. Have mercy, Lord. Please help. Uh, and we thank you for what you've already shown us. Uh, but God, we certainly recognize that we got to depend on you, rely on you. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would help us to know that you are a present help. Help us to know that you got all power. Help us to know that this world still belongs to you. And whatever you allow, whatever you permit, uh, there are so many things that you have decreed that you didn't want to happen, but it happens. You decreed thou shalt not kill, but killing is still happening. You decreed thou shalt not lie, but lying is still happening. You decreed you shall not covet, but covetous still happens. You decreed you shall not commit adultery, but it's still happening. You decreed, Lord that we would have no other God before you, but it's still happening. And so in those decrees that you've said what you didn't want, we recognize that humanity still chooses to do what you declared that we should not do. And so, God, we ask that you would forgive. But then also, Lord, we ask that you would allow your justice, yeah, your justice, the integrity of your character that says that when we do wrong, when we choose to do evil, when we choose to do those things that are contrary to your word and your will, your justice says, the integrity of your character says that you cannot allow your righteousness to be violated and stay neutral. So Lord, 
we pray for America. We pray for America. This country where babies are still dying uh, in mama's bellies because they have the right to abortion. We pray for America, Lord, where uh, sex trafficking is, is a major business in our world. We pray for America where pornography is a billion-dollar industry, Father. We pray that we would know beyond the shadow of a doubt you still sit on your throne, you still rule, and you still reign. You still know how to submit your justice. You still know how to let us know when you're not pleased with what's going on. And God, we feel the pinch of that. We feel that probe right now. We feel uh, uh, that chastisement. We feel that wrath and that anger. We sense it and we know it's real. So God, we're not going to pretend as though those of us in the church are innocent from what's going on, we recognize our own responsibility. Help us now to think through who we are, that we would demonstrate your character, that we would demonstrate your, your uh, expectations of us, that we would demonstrate walking in your spirit and living life to its fullest in a way that's pleasing to you. God, we're not asking you to cut us no slack. Because we recognize you've given us everything we need for life and for godliness. But we certainly thank you for your grace. And we certainly thank you for your mercy. Be with us now as we study your word. Let us say what you want said so that we might hear what we need to hear. So that we can be who we need to be and do what we need to do. We ask these things in the name of your son who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Once again, 2 Kings chapter 23. That is our reading for this particular Wednesday um, uh, as we go through our reading of the, uh, the, the, the Kings. We're going to finish this up, uh, I guess, basically on Friday uh, as it relates to uh, the book of Second Kings. And I think it has been a, a, a reminder to us of the just, the just the overwhelming understanding of how God's word is timeless. There's timeless truth. Uh, to God's word, and we find uh, we have found some timeless truth as we've read through uh, the book of Second Kings. Yes, although we recognize that there have been the uh, the issue of those kings of the north that have, were absolutely evil, uh, some kings of the south who were good kings. Uh, today, we get a chance to study and look at one of the good kings uh, in Second Kings twenty-three. If you have the handout available through uh, the email. You can look at that handout now, and we're going to just kind of walk through that uh, for the other moments that we uh, still have in our study for today. So what we're going to just title this particular uh, text before us is a recommitment to the covenant, a recommitment to the covenant. On your handout, you have verse 3 that's there uh, for your edification, particularly but let's do this. We want to read, uh, if you will, the, I want to read those passages starting at actually at verse 1. Because what we're looking at now is that uh, Judah had been in a, in a time of serious turmoil, just serious turmoil. I think, I think most of you uh, who have been reading, you had to be absolutely awestruck by uh, the, 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 the one before us today is Josiah, but you had to be awestruck by his uh, grandfather by the name of Manasseh. Uh, do this for me. Go to chapter 21, just, just for a moment. Look at uh, chapter 21 of Second Kings, and it says Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. I was talking to someone yesterday, and I said 52, and I thought about it, and I went back and looked at it, and I said, 55 years he reigned as the king of Judah for 55 years, and his mother's name was Hephzibah, Hephzibah. And notice what it says in verse 2. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And what was the evil that he did? Look at verse 3. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, who was, a, who was a considered a good king, had destroyed. 
he raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, listen, listen to this. Just an awful man, evil man. He even set a carved image of Asherah. I'm sorry, verse 6. And he also made his son pass through the fire. Practice sued, saying, use witchcraft and consulted spirits and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke the Lord, him to anger. So that's, that's enough. That kind of tells us this man's character. He was a king of Judah, and he was evil. He did wrong. And the Bible says that God, watch this, you have to believe that, God allowed him, God permitted him, God orchestrated, God ordained, because all government is ordained by God, Romans 13. God ordained that he would be the king of Judah for 55 years. He started at 12 years old, and he is 67 years old when he dies. So they were in a sense of evil as a nation for 55 years. Can you imagine that? All of the, the atrocities that went on, all of the madness uh, that went on all of that time, it was, it was a horrible it, it, it was a horrible time. It, 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 was, a, it was a crucial time. It was a, it was a critical time. Uh, right behind him, uh, his son actually became the king by the name of Ammon. If you look at chapter 21, look at verse 19. Ammon was 22, year, 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth, daughter of Haraz of Jorba. And notice verse 20. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. Wow. My goodness. So, so here they are. They are experiencing about 57 years of just a, a cruel king, an evil king, an evil ruler. Uh, but in the midst of it all, God is taking care of the remnant. God is still taking care of uh, those who choose to obey him. God is still providing for them. But, but, but they are under a cruel king, an evil king. However, as God would do when he chooses to do, because uh, Psalm 115 reminds us our God is in heaven and he does as he pleases. Daniel chapter 4 would remind us he still rules in what the kingdom of men and he raises who he will and he puts down who he will just as he chooses. And here it is, he raises up this young kid uh, go to chapter 22, look at verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, Jedidah, Jedidah and the daughter of Adiah of Bazkath. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And so he, he was one who chose to bring down those high places where people went to worship places that they shouldn't have worshipped. Um, he, he restored the, the uh, we would say, the, 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 the way of proper worship of God. Um, the, good, the good thing about it is that he reinstituted, he recommitted, he rededicated himself and the people to the original covenant of God. So look at chapter 23, start at verse 1. It says, Now the king sent to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Wow. Verse 3, and that's where we are. Then the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord 
What was the covenant? What was the promise that he was making? What was the agreement that he was making with the Lord? To follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book and all the people took a stand for the covenant. That, that, that is an absolutely wonderful uh, statement. That is an absolute wonderful demonstration of loyalty and love to God. Josiah, uh, he's been exposed, if you would, uh, to the word of God. If go back to chapter 20, 22, look at verse 8. It says, then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, meaning Josiah, bringing the king word saying, your servant have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it to the hand of those who do the work, oversee the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And as a result of him reading it, the Bible clearly says that, that now he repented of what he read because he recognized because of what his, grand, his father and his grandfather had done. I'm quite sure he'd been told, you know, he'd been told the stories of just how evil things were. He now repented he now changed his mind and decided that he wanted to do different than what his father and his grandfather had done. He says in verse 13 of chapter 22, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Listen, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize anything. I promise you when I say this. What I do realize, the things that are going on in our world, it's not... We as the people of God are not exempt from the problem. We have to recognize that we too are part of the problem. Uh, we, not, not again, not, not saying everybody. I'm not, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone. But I think all of us can admit as it relates to our relationship to God, our, our covenant relationship with God, all of us have to admit that there's some things that we absolutely could do better. There's some things that we, we, we kind of be complacent about. There's some things that we just don't, we don't give that much credence to. So what God is doing now, is just as he did with Josiah, I'm going to say that God is calling us, and I'm saying to us as from a practical standpoint as a church, let's recommit to the covenant. Well, let's recommit to the covenant. So, so what are we talking about uh, when we look at, at, at Josiah, in, in, I mean, 2 Kings chapter, chapter 23, verse 3, it says that he talks about, uh, the king stood at the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord, and it was to do what? To follow the Lord. And the word follow there would be the suggestion. Here is the implication or, no, the reality is to obey what he says and to keep his commandments. So it wasn't just a matter of hearing what God said, but it was also a matter of doing what his commandments. And, of course, we're looking at the handout. Uh, the commandment is what? It's an order. It's an, author it's an authoritative directive. Uh, it could be either written or verbal, uh, given as instruction or prescription to a subordinate. So when we look at it again, God is, the, is our king, and we are vassals, if you would, in his kingdom. We are servants of God. So God has the right, just as he did with Israel, God has the right to give us commands. He has the right to give us directives. And I, I'm, sometimes I am amazed that there are Christians who actually struggle with God telling me what to do. Hey, listen, folk, the word reminds us in the beginning, God created. So I'm looking at it from a standpoint, you know, if you got a business or if you run a, you got a family or if you own something, whatever, whatever that thing is that you have, you know, you, when you have ownership of that thing, you have a right to tell others what to do with what you have, right? You know, I mean, you don't just let people just do whatever they want to do with whatever it is that belongs to you. You just don't even do that in the natural so think about it. We're talking about God who created the heavens and the earth. So what it says here is that God has the right to tell his people what to do. 
uh, y'all have heard this before. Uh, my mom and my daddy, they, they, they used to say some stuff. It actually sounded like they were asking me to do things. My dad would say something like, you know, hey, you're going you gonna, to you gonna clean up the yard today? It sounded like a question, but I knew it wasn't. I knew clearly that was not a question. Uh, that was an expectation when then he got home this afternoon, this yard was going to be cleaned. Uh, my mom would leave and she'd say, y'all going to clean up the house, huh? And it sounded like we had an option. Sound like we could have stayed in the bed. Sound like we could have stayed in our pajamas. Sound like we could just watch television, it, it, you know, based on us. But the reality was, it was a command. They were telling us what we needed to do. And they had the right to do that. Why? Because they were our parents. It's our mother and our father. So God being our father, he has the right. So the goal is, is that he says he, he would follow him. And the goal was to what? To keep his commandments and his testimonies. Um, um, the, the, the word there for, for testimonies um, is, the, again, all the regulations, the decrees, the ordinances uh, with a clearly communicated prescription of what one should do. You know, when you read the Old Testament many times, uh, you look at the book of Exodus or you look at the book of Deuteronomy, God would give details as to what would happen. Think about this. Uh, we did it, I think, early on. We studied the book of Leviticus. Remember, if a person had leprosy, Moses had directives on what a person was to do. They were to go to the priest and identify that it was a leprosy, right? Then they were to quarantine, if you will, for 14 days. Now, before they could actually get back in the company of the people, the priest had to check out their house. He had to check out their body. And it was details as to, as to what had to be done. That's the testimony. It's those details that God gives us. You know, you, you got details uh, uh, in terms of laws that you are expected to practice. Think about this. Whenever we go to a stop sign, when we go to a stop sign, the law says we ought to count three seconds. Ha! Most, of, <laughs> most of us roll. Up. But those are the details uh, that are that are given to us. I remember. I remember years ago when Zach first started driving, and uh, when he would make a right turn wherever he would always turn in the inside lane. He would always turn in. The, I'm sorry, to the outside lane, always. And his mom would be asking him, "Why are you doing that?" He said, "Cause the law said that that's what I'm supposed to do." But y'all think about it. And when we can all come off the street, we're making a right turn. It can be a three lane street. We'll go all the way to the inside lane. And that again details. That's what the testimony is on. Then he talks about the statutes. Uh, these are the stipulations, the regulations, all the principles, having authority to, to give what? Consequences for not keeping with a possible focus that these commands serve as a warning, urging, or witness to the covenant agreement. Again, we, I'm, I'm staying with the, with the whole thing with having a license. I agree that when I'm given a license, I'm going to observe, if you would, the laws based upon whatever state I may be in, correct? And last time I looked, uh, caution light don't mean speed, but that's what many of us do. But when you go to the fact, what it's saying, that caution light is there to give a warning that the red light is coming up and it would be best that you stop because if you don't, there might be some consequences and it may be negative consequences that one may experience as a result of doing that. So those, those, again, those are just the things uh, that, 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 that Josiah was saying to the people on the basis of the law of God when he would read Exodus or when he would read Leviticus or he would read Deuteronomy. He would see how it was explicitly laid out in terms of God's expectation. And it's no different for us. It's no different for us. So what we're saying is, is that he made a call to recommit to that covenant because there had been evil in the land. I mean gross evil. I mean all kinds of evil that was going on in that nation for 57 years. Um, and he was, he, had, he had, 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 had knowledge enough that others could tell him, uh, these older men, these older priests, these older scribes that were there, they could tell him what his dad had done. Because remember, he was eight years old when he became king. Uh, they could tell him what his grandfather Manasseh had done. Uh, and, and so he wanted to make a change. He recognized that something needed to be different than what he had been doing. So now, uh, the word says, his testimony and his statutes, and how is he doing to do it? With all of his heart. 
meaning that it was to be intentional. It was to be very intentional. He would think it through in the heart of his mind. This is what God is saying to me. And at the heart of, uh, heart of his mind, he wanted to be intentional in obeying the word of God. If I were to ask you today, how intentional are you about obeying God? How, how intentional are you? When you wake up, it, it is, is it your intention to do what God says? Is it your intention to be obedient to him? Or do you just kind of wake up and the, the attitude is, you know, however this day go, this is how it's going to go. But is there some intentionality? Say it, was, it was within him, and he says, in all of his soul, meaning that in his inner being, again, uh, uh, what, 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 what the idea was is that the place where God dwelt, uh, the place where, or in, in our case, the place where God dwells is that in his inner being, in his innermost mind, his goal was to please the Lord. Now, 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 was he gonna was he gonna be challenged with it? Absolutely. But listen, folk, we will never come to a point that we can notice the word, to perform the words of the covenant that are written in the book. We never come to a point to perform, to be obedient to God, to do the things that God has called for us to do, if we're not intentional about it. Oh, I tell you, some of the most profound words I ever heard and, and still resonates with me today, I guess I started hearing this around 1969, somewhere around there. I would literally say around, around the, the, wow, the second Sunday, November 1969. I would venture to say I probably started hearing it then. Uh, Reverend Fred Dixon, who's going to be with the Lord now, used to make this statement, and most of you know where I've gone already. He would say, if you want to do, you can do. If you don't want to do, you won't do. That simple statement, but there's a profundity to it that says that if it's not within me, if, it, if I don't have the desire, if I'm not intentional, that's what God wants. God wants intentionality from us. All of us, all of us who, you know, we've been raised up, you know, and now we have children. Uh, it, that's something about, that's something about, you know, when we tell our children to do something and, and we see that they want to do it, that just makes it different. You know, I think most of us, I grew up in a house, my, 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 my mom and dad didn't really care if I wanted to do it. I mean, I had to do it, you know, uh, but, but, but that's something about when people want to do it. And with God, that's the only way it can be. Uh, I, cannot, I, I cannot be begrudging about what God says. So, so Josiah made that. But notice, what we want to look at is what covenant was he committed to? What covenant was he committed to? So uh, uh, I'm asking that question. What covenant did Josiah and the people recommit themselves to? First one that to look at is number one on the, on the handout, if you're looking there. Israel's covenant was based on the promise God originally made to Abram. That's in Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1, 2, and 3. I want to turn there. We're going to read that passage quickly. Uh, but I want you to just look at that particular passage. Uh, it's how, in, in a sense, how God initiated his making himself known to humanity to the extent that he would enter into a covenantal relationship with humanity. He would, he would, he would make promises to humanity. He would say, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is how I'm going to lead you. This is how I'm going to guide you. This is how I am going to provide for you. So notice, uh, chapter 12, Genesis 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, watch this, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So going back to the handout, what do we see? Just kind of quickly working through it, and then got some handouts, some blanks for you to fill. Um, uh, the covenant was based upon the promise God originally made to Abram. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and through, he, one, two, 1 through 3, I'm sorry. It, first of all, look at it personally. When you look at personally, uh, look what he does. He would be the father. This is what he says to him. I'm promising you. He would be the father of a great nation. The second one, if you fill in the blank there, he would receive personal blessing. He would receive per personal blessing. He would receive personal blessing. Number three, 
he would receive personal honor and reputation. And then number four, you fill in the blank, he would be the source of blessing to others. He would be the source of blessing to others. Number two, again, fill in the blank, he would receive personal blessing. And number four, he would be the source of blessing to others. And again, so let's just unpack it for just a moment. He says again, looking at, ver at verse uh, 2 of Genesis chapter 12, he says, I will make you what? A great nation. That's God making a promise. He's going to do that. It has nothing to do with you, Abraham, uh, just in terms of I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this done through you. Um, I will bless you. He would receive what? Personal blessing. He says, and I will make your name great. He would receive personal honor and reputation. And then he says, and you shall be a blessing. He would be a source of blessing to others. Isn't that amazing? That just, that's just wonderful when you think about it. Let's look at it universally. Uh, you find that in verse 3. The blessing would be for those people and nations that blessed Abraham and the nation that came from him. The curses would come upon those people and nations that curse Abraham and Israel. Number three, the blessings would be upon the families of the earth through the Messiah recorded uh, to, the f to the flesh uh, is uh, Abraham's son. Uh, again, they provided salvation for the entire world. Notice again in verse, in verse three, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. And of course, we get a record of that. We know it's talking about, again, we talk about progressive revelation. Go to Acts chapter 3. It helps us to understand that ultimately the blessing that he was talking about was Messiah. The blessing that he was talking about was Jesus Christ. And that's, 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 that's what we celebrate today. All right. So at the bottom of, the, of that particular page, uh, we ask, what covenant did Josiah and the people recommit themselves to? You want to you just fill that in best you, best you can. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. It is called the Abrahamic covenant covenant and it is the covenant that all other covenants that we talk about are you you see it's we through all other covenants it's called the Abrahamic covenant just again spell it best you can just at the bottom of the page so that you would know again that's the covenant that Josiah or initiated from the the covenant that Josiah and the people have now recommitted themselves to number number two on the next page, Israel's covenant was also based upon blessing for obedience and cursing uh, for disobedience. Let's now go to Exodus chapter 19. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19 now. Just want to look at that for just a moment because here it is that God has now, uh, you know, he, he speaks to Abraham in chapter 15 and he told him that I'm going to allow your people, I'm going to allow uh, the, 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 the tribe or the 12 sons of Jacob to be in an incubator, if you would, in Egypt, and I'm going to make them a great nation, and after 430 years, I'm going to bring them back to this promised land that I'm showing you, because remember one of the blessings that he told Abraham is that he was going to bless him with land, right? So God takes 430 years, and the promise that he made to Abraham, he actually fulfilled that promise, and notice what he did. He did it with a what? A covenant. Because now he is moving from one person, a patriarch by the name of Abraham, and now he is moving to a nation established with, with his people that he calls Israel. Israel, again, those who strive with God. Uh, those who strive with God. Those who strive with God. So in, Mo, in, in, in Exodus chapter 19, look at verse 5 through 8. Let's read it. Now, therefore, if you will... Indeed, obey my voice, watch this, and keep my, what, covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. That's what the Lord told the nation of Israel. And you shall be to me, watch this, I love this language, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Verse 7, so Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And of course, we go to Deuteronomy 28. It helps us to understand to a larger degree how he expands on an understanding of what that covenant is about. So again, you look at it, number two. A, 
The commandments governed their personal lives, particularly as they were related to God. Yeah, the commandments that God had given. The judgments governed their social lives, particularly as they were related to one another. And the ordinances governed their religious lives so that the people would know how to approach God on the terms that he dictated. Wow, this is cool stuff. They had the commandments. God is telling them what to do, giving them instruction on what to do. They had the judgments. The judgments were, were, were designed primarily to show them how they were to relate uh, to one another, what they would do to, toward one another. The ordinances were those things that were prescribed that they do from almost, in a sense, from a religious order to show that that was to be a right approach to God. You didn't just come into him any kind of way. You didn't just approach him any kind of way. And I just, I just, I just need to say this as a side note. I've, uh, I've had enough conversation now uh, to find out that uh, some of you all, some of you all laying in the bed on Sunday morning, and that's, that's a shame. That's, that's a shame. I'm just being honest with you. That's not a right way to approach God. That is, that is not a right way for us to approach God. Again, if you're sick, I fully understand. But if you are well, if you're doing fine, uh, remember that, that Sunday is a, is a, is a day that, that, that has been prescribed for the purpose of us properly worshiping him, right? That we come together to worship him. And I know what some of y'all are saying. I'm at home, yeah, but you're home with Christians. You're home with other people, so you can still gather. And so uh, I just want to let you know, just as your pastor, I'm disappointed to hear that. Uh, and it probably more so in parents, if you're allowing your children to do that, uh, uh, come on, let's, let's recommit, let's recommit, let's com recommit uh, to the commandments of God. The things that God commands us to do, uh, we're in this pandemic, yeah, and listen, it's been four months uh, since we've been able to, quote, unquote, get to the building, but the reality is that our commandments, you know, listen, on an average week, most of us, most of us, and that's something I think you know as a congregation I've talked about, most of us spend two hours in the building on an average week. Most of us. Most of us. Um, 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 some of us are here a little bit more. We come out on Wednesday night. We're here for Sunday school, so we spend a little, few more hours, if you would, in this particular building. But on average, most of us spend about two hours. So, so, so what I'm saying is let, let's, not, let's not neglect. Let's, let's recommit. Let's rededicate ourselves. Let's uh, redevote ourselves. Uh, to the, the, the covenant that, that we have made with God, that God has made with us through his son Jesus Christ, and, and not be lackadaisical when it comes to obedience to God. Not to be lackadaisical when it comes to obedience to how, uh, to, in terms of how we treat uh, one another. Husbands, you ought to be loving your wives. Wives, you ought to be respecting your husbands. Uh, if you have an aged parent, you ought to be honoring your aged parents. If you have children, you ought to be raising them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. If you're cussing, you ought to stop. If you're always angry, you, 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 ought, to, you, ought, to, you ought to be happy uh, because God is expecting us to relate properly to one another regardless of whether or not we come to a building or not. That is not what our relationship is based on. It is based upon the fact that God has chosen through Jesus Christ to enter into a covenant relationship with us. And so that kind of leads us there. I'm going to say, I see, uh, what covenant was that for Israel? It was called the Mosaic Covenant. Or you could say the, the law of Moses, however you want to put it. Um, uh, the law that God gave Moses. But it was called, this covenant was called the Mosaic Covenant. So on one hand, you had the Abrahamic Covenant. Then you had the Mosaic Covenant. And here's the final one that we're going to look at today. Number three, Israel's covenant will be based on, a new, prom on new promises uh, for their future as a nation. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. And I know you're saying, wow, so Israel had a covenant from God, a new covenant in the book, from the book of Jeremiah? Well, what does this new covenant entail? Let's look at it. I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 31. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And what is he talking about? The Mosaic covenant right here. My covenant, watch this, which they broke, the Mosaic covenant. They broke the covenant. 
though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But here's the contrast to the old covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, and, and for Israel, it is yet future. He says, I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Watch this. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all, they shall all, I'm sorry, they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will do what? I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Wow. This is the covenant that God has made with Israel. And I want you to notice now the elements of that covenant. And we'll be closing shortly. Number three. Israel's covenant will be based on new promises for the future as a nation. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. God will put his law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Wow. Meaning that, watch this, they would permanently have his law. It wouldn't be on a scroll. It wouldn't be on a rock. It wouldn't be uh, uh, based on something that they had to open. No, he would put it in their hearts permanently. Number two, Yahweh will be their God and the nation will be his people. Ooh, that's wonderful. He is the Yahweh, the Lord meaning he will be their God and the nation will be his people. They will be taught individually by God, watch this, through the personal ministry of the Holy Spirit. Then here's the blank that you're filling in there. Their sins will be forgiven and completely removed. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, what is this covenant? Again, if you're writing uh, just in that, in that space under the letter D that you just filled in, their sins will be forgiven and completely removed. I'm going to say it again. Their sins will be forgiven and completely removed. One more time. Their sins will be forgiven and completely removed. Remember, this is future for the nation of Israel. It's yet future for them. But notice what, 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 how does he, what does he, ref, how do we refer to this covenant? We call this covenant what? The new covenant. Oh, wait a minute. The nation of Israel Mosaic law, Palestinian law, you're going to have land, uh, the promised land that God promised, still going to do that. But you're telling me that God chose now to give to Israel a new covenant? And here's the point with that. When we look back at what, Jer what again, what Josiah did, in the fact, the Bible clearly says that he, he, he made the commitment, the, the king stood by a pillow, made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, all his soul, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. That is the covenant that he's talking about. So when he reads the word of God, he would even find that God is saying to them, I want to enter into this relationship with you because I've got promises. I've got things that I want to provide for you. I want to have this personal, intimate relationship with you. And even though Israel broke his law, he still chose to be in a covenant relationship with them. And here is the good news. You and I, as believers, share in that new covenant experience. Go back to it. Go back to it. Looking at verse 33, again, he would say, uh, God will put his law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. Look at verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with you in the house, with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law where? In their minds. And so guess what? Guess what? Guess what? We sing that little song, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Why do I do that? Because God's word is now in my heart. It is in my mind. And it's there what through the gift, the guarantee, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. He will remind us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The reason that I can understand the things that I understand about God is because the Spirit of God is in me. You ought to clap your hand. Praise the Lord right now. The fact that the Holy Spirit lives in you. God's Holy Spirit lives in you. And he reminds us 
of the things of God. So even through this pandemic, can't get to the building, all of that sort of thing that's going on. I understand the problem with that. I understand the impatience that we have with that. But keep that, even that in mind, that God has given the abil- us the ability to, what? to endure. God has given us the ability to bear up under, even when circumstances and situations are not conducive, is not the best for us. God is reminding us, you just obey my word. Do what I say. I will give you joy beyond what you can ever imagine. You will have a peace that just surpasses all understanding. You just continue to be faithful to what I've called for you to do. Just again, what he said, obeying his word. Here's the last thing, and I promise I'm done. The covenant is made. This is the last paragraph at the bottom of the page. The The new covenant is made sure by the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. The blood which guarantees to Israel its new covenant also provides for the forgiveness of sins for the believers who comprise the church. Jesus' payment for sin is more than adequate to pay for the sins of all who will believe in him. The new covenant is called new in contrast to the covenant with Moses which is called old because it actually accomplishes what the Mosaic covenant could only point to. That is... The child of God living in a manner that is consistent with the character of God. Ah! Why, how can we make it through this pandemic? We have the character of God. How can we make it when we're not where we would like to be? We have the character of God. How can I still be kind when I get so much bad news, whether it's from the house, how, uh, the White House, or uh, whether it's from the State House or the, the the State Mansion, when I get bad news, how how can I still have joy in the midst of all of that? How can I still rejoice? It's because of the blood of Jesus, folk. It's because of the sacrifice of Christ. So it becomes my motivation for committing, recommitting myself to the covenant that has been made. You remember Luke chapter 22. Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And as a result, what he is saying to us, that because of his sacrifice, our sins have been forgiven. Praise the Lord. We now have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit permanently in us. Praise the Lord. We don't have to wonder whether or not we're going to heaven or we're going to hell. It has already been declared we have eternal life. Praise the Lord. God has made the promise that he is our father and he will supply our need according to his riches and glory. Praise the Lord. He says you can count it all joy when you go through trials knowing that the testing of your faith will produce endurance, but you got to let it have its perfect work so that you might be complete and entire, lacking nothing. But if you lack, he says, ask God, and he will give you wisdom. Praise the Lord, folk. So we ought to recommit ourselves to the covenant relationship that we have with God our Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. To that end, I just ask, uh, let's, let's, let's recommit to being serious about God. In closing, let's recommit to, uh, to doing those things that are pleasing to God, to doing those things that make him smile, to doing those things that make him happy. Um, it's not about us having our way. It's about us allowing God to have his way, and that while he is having his way, we want to do things his way. We want to do things according to his will. As a result of what Josiah did, the nation experienced just a wonderful time of blessing uh, for those 31 years that he ruled as king. Uh, Judah was much better off. Again, those who obeyed, everybody didn't obey. Everybody didn't do what was right. So my hope is I'm saying as pastor, I hope that all of you who are members of this congregation, all of you are members of the Church of Jesus Christ universally, wherever you're listening from, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, recommit yourself, rededicate yourself, devote yourself again to the covenant relationship that you have with God through Jesus Christ. Our Father and our God, how we thank you again for just the blessing of life and whew, just the richness of knowing how much you care about us, how you take care of the details of our life, how you're concerned about everything that we go through. 
And I pray, God, that going forward that you would help us to have a mindset that in everything that we say and everything that we do is that we bring glory and honor to you. Forgive us for those areas where we've been weak. Forgive us for those areas where we've compromised. Forgive us for those areas where we've been complacent. But thank you for giving us another chance so that we can recommit ourselves to this covenant that you've given us through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you. We bless you, honor you, and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, we will uh, be with you all together again on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And I, my prayer is that God continue to bless and keep all of us until we meet again. Love you, good shepherd.